Okay, everyone. I'm Courtney Worrell. I'm the president of the Waterfront Alliance, and welcome to today's webinar on a wedge project that we are celebrating here at the Waterfront Alliance and with the entire Waterfront community, as well as New York City. Uh, the South Battery Park City Coastal Resilience Project has received the wedge verification, and so today's webinar is about that. And so uh, we will be talking about the project itself. However, I will spend probably 15 or 20 minutes going over the wedge standard to let you know what we do and how we do it. Then I'll pass it off to the team, uh, the Battery Park City Authority team, um, who will be talking about the project. So let's go to the next slide. And I should have mentioned also, there'll be time for Q&A. So we're looking forward to your questions. Actually, I should say that, is that make sure to put your questions in, in the, um, the Q&A box, and then we'll be answering them at the end of the presentations. All right, so um, we're joined today by Gwen Dawson, who's the Senior Vice President of Real Property at Battery Park City Authority, and Gonzalo Cruz, Vice President and Design Principal at, at the, um, in the NYC New York City Landscape Studio at AECOM and Nikita Jatham, who is Senior Environmental Designer at Altair 10. Welcome, we're looking forward to hearing from you guys today. So just a little bit about the Waterfront Alliance. We are um, an alliance of over a thousand organizations across New York and New Jersey. Our mission is together with many communities and many people and people across many different sectors, build, transform, revitalize and protect accessible waterfronts for all communities. We were started 17 years ago as a New York, New Jersey based organization. We are working very strongly in both New York and New Jersey with a strong emphasis on New York City, but our programs are moving national and the WEDGE program is one of those programs that now applies to work all across the country for freshwater and coastal systems. And I'll be telling you a bit more about that. So next slide. Okay, so this is a picture and, and some of our, our logos are related to the Wedge program, but this picture is of Brooklyn Bridge Park. And it is what we use as kind of the example of what brings all of the different features of Wedge together. The three standards that we work hardest for and we want the projects that go through the verification to prove is that they the projects have met the highest standards for coastal resiliency. That, that the projects are able to meet challenges that we face from climate impacts where anywhere where water meets land, that those projects not only do that, but they also are protecting ecology and enhancing ecology at the edge. Water, where water meets land, is some of the most ecologically productive and sensitive places on the planet. And where we design and how we design on the waterfront is very, very crucial to leaving us a living planet and allowing the planet to, to respond and change to climate change. And lastly, the third principle of wedge is access. That can take many different forms, but access for people, for boats, but also for understanding what is going on at the waterfront. And that particularly applies to industrial facilities where access to or on the water is not possible but there's a very important role in the community understanding and being able to commit at being being able to access the the basics about what projects are all about and what the, these facilities and their communities are all about. So we can talk about that as well. So just to be clear, not every waterfront site needs to look like Brooklyn Bridge Park or South Battery Park City Coastal Resilience Project. The where water meets land are, is a very diverse set of, of land uses and, and ecologies all across the world. And so we are not pushing for a particular design, rather the waterfront, uh, the Waterfront Alliance's wedge program is a, is a verification program that does not dictate a specific outcome. It's a set of objective standards, but not prescriptive because there is really truly no no uh, you know no one size fits all in waterfront development. Every community is different. Every design has and every site presents different design constraints and opportunities and there are many different resources and needs to that communities have for most projects. So we push to design better projects, better waterfronts in all kinds of locations. The next slide so this is just the basics on what the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines program consists of. There are six standards. 
So um, it's a voluntary set of guidelines that help develop waterfront properties. The first standard is site assessment and planning. The next is community access and connections. The third is natural resources and sustainability. The fourth is climate hazard and, res and resilience. Uh, the next is edge composition. And the final category is innovation. So the way that the wedge verification works is that the Waterfront Alliance assembles a team of experts who do the review that consists of Waterfront Alliance staff, uh, an expert architect, landscape architects, coastal engineers, and flood risk experts. They review the project under two phases. The first is a preliminary view, review, and the last is a final review. The final review is done when construction documents are completed. So in the case of Battery Park City, uh, the, the Battery Park City project, the project earned 125 points out of 215 points possible in the standard. No project can actually get to 215 points. That's absolutely impossible because the standard is not prescriptive. 115 are necessary to pass. So again, the project passed with 125, which is a very good, very good number. The project went through preliminary, re preliminary review in April of 2022, and the final review was completed in fall of 2023. Next slide. So this project um, is added to um, a large portfolio and a, a, a growing portfolio. It is the 13th project nationally that the Waterfront Alliance has verified. You will see from, um, sorry, let's go to the next slide. We, you will see from this slide that there are projects um, in New York, but also uh, also projects in other parts of the country. Um, a couple of years ago, we verified a wa waterfront park in Wilmington, North Carolina, which was the first one outside of the region. We also recently verified Jose Marti Park in Miami, Florida, and we are soon to be verifying a project in the Great Lakes, which will be announced in the next few days or so. Right now, we have a number of projects in the pipeline, um, over 10 or more, and these are in locations such as Connecticut and New Jersey, Windport sites, and we have many conversations going on in other parts of the country and the West Coast as well. Let's go to the next slide. So the one part of the WEDGE program is that we, we actually certify professionals who become knowledgeable and, and bearers of the standard. So we just completed one of our WEDGE professionals course and um, about 100 or more people are now newly uh, minted WEDGE professionals, but it's a current network of about five to 600 people across the country. The, the majority of the professionals we have are in New York and Florida and New Jersey and Connecticut in the Northeast. California as well. And you're seeing, we're seeing more and more growth in the center of the country and in other parts of the country. And one thing that's really important to point out, which I mentioned before, is that just last year, the wedge standard was updated to move from just a strictly coastal standard to a freshwater systems and coastal standard. So now lakes and rivers and streams can also, uh, where projects are located, can also go through the wedge verification program. All right, let's go to the next slide. So just a little bit on the history and the rigor of the wedge process. So the wedge concept and the concept for this program was launched and, and basically incubated in 2010. And then about seven years ago, we consolidated 150 experts from across many, many dif different disciplines to finalize the first set of most rigorous designs, or uh, excuse me, most rigorous standards for, for wedge. And then in 2018, we did a major update with the technical working group. You can see a lot of names there, especially locally. And then in 2023, as I mentioned, we launched the freshwater um, and freshwater systems version uh, that is combined with a coastal version of WEDGE. And that technical advisory committee in 2023 consisted of a very wide range of experts as well um, with teams across the country. So it's really important that these uh, that we use the best in technical guidance from across the country. And I think the other thing that's really important to note in all of this is that WEDGE is really the, one of the most interdisciplinary standards that there is. And if you think about waterfront development itself, 
it is and has to be by nature so interdisciplinary. So that's what we strive for in all of our technical requirements and all of the updates for Wedge. Let's go to the next slide. So I just wanna cover just at a minimum and David, you can just click through all of them just to make, make them all show up on the screen. So the very, very minimum requirements for any, white, any Wedge property is that the site must include um, the, the, the site must include water of some kind. There has to be a water's edge on the property. The next is that the projects must include a soft or natural shoreline within some portion of the project bounds or an enhancement, an ecological enhancement to a hardened shoreline. The projects all must engage the community in some way and, and in a very good high standards way. Projects must have public access and or as I mentioned with industrial sites, there are other ways to provide public access, visitor centers, regular tours, open access for questions from community members, et cetera. Projects must avoid intentionally introducing invasive plants and or any other kind of species. And projects must build to a minimum design flood elevation that incorporates sea level rise where applicable. And that would only not apply to freshwater systems and as well a minimum standard for freeboard. Okay, so let's go to the next slide and we're gonna just jump into some of the, the categories that I already mentioned, next slide. So the very first category is category zero, which is the basic category of starting. And that's why it's a zero and not a one. And that's that you gotta get it right at the beginning in order to get it done. And basically it's whether or not you have a multi disciplinary team, project team, a multidisciplinary interdisciplinary team that's been set up to work on the project. That the site has assessed and understands the social and ecological context and vulnerabilities, that there is a plan for stakeholder engagement that's equitable, community input that's equitable, and that also commits to many different standards that go just beyond this, the regular community meeting standard. And that there's um, the um, plan to create a maintenance and adaptive management plan to last throughout the life of the project. Let's go to the next slide. So category one then is where you start to get into the design. So the issue, the, the category here is climate and hazard resilience. And the goal is for project teams to use responsible development strategies for project siting and resilience that account for climate change and flood risks. This is really a key part of the resilience standards. So under this category, the site must avoid or reduce flood risk from water body, must reduce fluvial flooding and stormwater discharge, must improve stormwater discharge quality, establish an emergency preparedness and response plan, and reduce its, the contribution to urban heat in areas especially of, of high urban density. Next slide, category two covers community access and connections. And the purpose of this one is to make sure that waterfronts are accessible and welcoming and inspiring and, and that a diverse group of people are able to enjoy and take part in these places that we all treasure as humans. So some of the standards within this are providing quality public access areas on the waterfront, designing sites to improve visual and other sensory connections to the water, supporting industrial water dependent uses, reducing industrial impacts to human health and well-being, and providing diverse programming and passive education features. So um, it's really important also to note that, that we do support industry in the, in the wedge standard that did not apply to this project, but that is an important part, especially when we're talking about moving goods and freight by water and not by truck, which has many, many benefits. Let's go to the next slide for the rest of the parts of the standard. So the next is um, increasing, sorry, David, we'll go back to category two. There should be a second, yep. Increasing transportation access to the waterfront, creating maritime or environmental employment opportunities, increasing waterfront pathway and green, greenway connectivity, providing di direct connections to the water for people and boats, and also supporting a diverse and sustainable maritime activity where it's possible. These are all the things that help bring about better access and community connections at any waterfront site. All right, so let's move down to category three, which is edge composition. So this is about making sure that the, the project is designed with appropriate site conditions in mind and is sensitive to local ecology and improves overall resilience. 
So under this standard, or under this category, choosing an appropriate edge composition for the intended use of the project is key. Maintaining or emulating a natural shoreline and shape. Uh, protecting the working waterfront edge and on sites where that applies and making sure that the project is, is providing ecologically enhanced structural components. All right, let's move to the next slide, category four. So this covers natural resources and sustainability and, and many of these categories cover ecology, but this is where it all comes together. So this is about designing the site with ecological sensitivity, creating, restoring, or maintaining habitats and ecosystem services that are inherent to the project or inherent to this location, preserving and, eco preserving and increasing ecosystem connectivity across sites, providing native, native habitat complexity and biodiversity, avoiding human disturbance to natural resources, which is a key part of this, developing and cleaning up graded sites. And the next slide covers the remaining standards under this category, practicing and using sustainable fill, soil, uh, fill and soil management, renewable energy, reducing emissions through carbon management, practicing environmentally responsible construction, reducing um, water use on the site, pot potable water, and engaging a partner to study or monitor the site after the site is developed. Okay, let's move to the last category, which is innovation. So this is where a project can score points for an innovation in design or an in innovation in a use of a product that hasn't been used really ever before, where we have seen few to, none pro to no projects at all go through the wedge verification program or anywhere uh, that have used some of the innovations that, that may be available for the site. So this is really above and beyond and a really important part of making sure that we are continuing to re reward those projects that are pushing the envelope and are trying out new technologies and new approaches to all of these different goals that we have under Wedge. So, um, this, so we look at inventive design and particularly if there's a way to measure and, and show exemplary performance over the time and lifetime of the site. All right, so that covers the basics of Wedge. There's a lot more to go into. Uh, if anyone is interested in becoming a Wedge associate and becoming an expert in, in this, please check out our online course on Wedge where you can become a Wedge associate. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Gwen, if I'm not mistaken, is that right? Yes, yes. Great, well, thank you, Gwen, take it away. Thank you, Courtney. Good afternoon to all of you. I'm Gwen Dawson. I'm the Senior Vice President of Real Property for Battery Park City Authority. Um, I'm really delighted to be with you today, and I'm even more delighted to mark the occasion of having received wedge verification for our South Battery Park City Resiliency Project, uh, which you're about to hear more about. And I want to thank Courtney and her team um, for all of the cooperation and support um, that they provided for, for the South Battery Park City Resiliency Project as we've uh, moved forward with that. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Battery Park City, we are a 50-year-old mixed-use neighborhood created by the introduction of landfill into the Hudson River at the southwestern edge of Manhattan. Battery Park City comprises 92 acres with 36 acres of parks and over a mile of waterfront pedestrian esplanade. As such, we really cherish our connection with the water. It is this proximity and relationship with the waterfront that makes us so vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and sea level rise and which created the need for the South Battery Park City Resiliency Project, which uh, in this map occurs at the lower portion of, uh, of this map. You'll hear more about the exact um, location. Uh, if you back up, there we go. Um, throughout uh, Battery Park City Authority's history, we, we've had um, a, a lot of, of changes. Um, there are a lot of categories and factoids that, that are listed on this um, uh, this slide, I'm not going to go into them. Uh, if you have a chance to look at them later, you can learn more about the uh, the makeup and uh, the, the 
how many cultural institutions, how many residents, um, well, how many square feet of uh, commercial space um, exists within Battery Park City, um, and some things that you might find particularly interesting. Next slide. Uh, we've we've had a long history of prioritizing considerations of sustainability in the environment, uh, adopting practices such as organic maintenance of our parks, um, lead certification for our buildings, and the creation of a far-reaching sustainability plan. So it was a it was a natural that we would want to extend that focus into our coastal resiliency projects. So I'm not going to take any more of the time. I'm going to turn it over to Nikita Jathan at this point so that you can learn a little bit more about the, the project in particular. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Hi, everyone. My name is Nikita Jathan. I am with Atelier 10, and we were engaged by the project team um, to actually help select and then administer a third-party benchmarking system for the project. So I want to talk a little bit about why and how we actually came to choose Wedge. Um, we reviewed a wide range of building and site-focused benchmarking systems to make sure we found the right fit for the project. Um, it was really important to the team that the system selected aligned with a few things, one being the priorities of BPCA, as you saw from the earlier slides that Gwen just presented, BPCA has a really long history of sustainability leadership. And at this phase in design, um, early in design, BPCA had also released a resilience action plan and had just announced its intent, intent to chart a roadmap to achieve a carbon neutral battery park city. We also wanted to benchmark key project strategies. So with both of those you know, concepts in mind, we developed five drivers um, and evaluated how each uh, benchmarking system addressed each of those topics. Wedge really stood out to us by addressing a majority of the project drivers that you see on the screen. Um, as well as BPCA priorities at the time in a really meaningful way without also requiring maybe undue additional effort or cost for, for the project. Um, at the time, we felt like carbon and energy were a bit less represented um, at that time in Wedge, though the new version of Wedge um, recently released does actually increase that focus. Um, but at the time, the team saw an opportunity to use um, the, the one building on uh, Wagner Park, the pavilion building, which you're, you might hear a little bit about in this presentation, uh, to use that building as a leading example in their roadmap to carbon neutrality. So we paired the wedge system for uh, Wagner Park with a building focused net zero carbon certification. And you can go to the next slide. So fast forward to late last year when we actually completed our wedge verification. Um, this slide provides just a quick summary of the achieved points across the respective categories of wedge. I won't go into every credit we achieved here, but I will say um, the project achieved full points in the site assessment and planning category, um, which I think we were really excited about and a big testament to um, the level of kind of intentional planning efforts that went into the project. Categories one and two really allowed us to highlight um, meaningful coastal risk reduction, protection of the existing site's inherent qualities, access to the esplanade um, and, and site, and expanding programming and access along that. Categories three and four were more challenging for this project, um, but it gave us great benchmarks to keep pushing the design. Um, as one noted, this is an existing urban park and it's built up on a hard shoreline edge. Um, but even so, the team was able to find ways to meaningfully improve the edge and ecosystem services on this part where it was feasible. Um, and so you'll hear a lot more on many of those strategies um, in the next portion of the presentation. Uh, next slide. But really more so than credit achievement, I think what's really valuable to reflect on is how we were able to use Wedge as a tool on this project. Um, one, there was a lot that was already inherently part of this design prior to even the adoption of Wedge formally, um, but Wedge really allowed the team to track those achievements and then communicate them in a meaningful way to the public. That includes um, some really forward-thinking coastal risk reduction studies, um, simulations, community engagement efforts, and a really robust site design that prioritized public space and access. 
Um, two, Wedge really helped support the documentation of strategies that we know are critically important to the success of a project's long-term operations. So the development of operations and maintenance manuals and an adaptive management plan um, allowed us to connect wedge strategies to then documented maintenance practices. Um, and having that as a resource is going to be extremely valuable to ensuring that this site endures and then performs as it was designed to. And then finally, I think as is expected for a project of this scale and complexity, there were obstacles that arose in the process, whether that had to do with budget or logistics. And sometimes those conversations put key design strategies on the table. Um, and we felt like Wedge was extremely valuable at those points in advocating to maintain these elements, um, particularly when, uh, particularly some elements tied to improving aquatic ecology um, and even renegotiating this project's relationship with the river's edge, which you'll see in that image, um, but you'll hear much more about when Gonzalo walks you through the project design next. I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Nikita. Uh, can you hear me well? Gonzalo, you are on mute now though. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Nikita. That was a, a great sort of uh, uh, introduction to uh, getting into the meat and how all of the credits and, and the accreditation um, actually worked. Uh, just a little bit of context. Uh, you know, our project sits within the boundaries of the South Battery Park City Resiliency Project. And as we, most of you know, having sort of, uh, having familiarized yourselves with, you know, the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Projects, this is one of many projects and programs that the city and Battery Park City is moving uh, forward to uh, prevent fro uh, from flood risk reduction and allow for a, a certain level of public amenities in the, in the case of our projects, a robust waterfront park. All right, so uh, I, I am not going to continue the conversation before talking to you about how this whole thing came uh, became possible. You know, one of the one of the credits that we got or one of the props that we got from the project was the fact that we have a substantial, robust uh, um, uh, consulting team, you know, a, a, a team of experts and everybody came in with their best. And we, we came up with an incredible uh, set of opportunities for the future of Wagner Park and South Valley Park City uh, resiliency project. I mean, it's it, it's a labor of love. You know, some of it, you know, we were incredibly happy to uh, receive the verification because we have been at it for a number of years now, and um, you know, the the verification is is uh, is basically a testament of all the hard work that our team has put together um, to date to come away with an amazing park um, and series of public spaces. You know, this is not going to be about, you know, where the numbers are of the design flood elevation. I think that you heard a little bit from Nikita about the, the effort that we, we that went through to uh, ensure that the primary purpose of the project was uh, executed, which was the, the, that we need uh, coastal protection or uh, climate risk reduction along the this lower areas of the waterfront in Manhattan. So, you know, we're working with the 2050s, 100-year flood benchmarks, which are basically a standard for most projects along these uh, waterways. Um, next slide. And so how, how really, uh, you know, like there's a number of, of challenges, you know, the, all of these conversations or these questions began when Superstorm Sandy happened. You know, we were suddenly put at, uh, on, on edge. Uh, we, we were given an alert to actually uh, uh, speculate and, and predict uh, ahead of time what could happen into the future with these projects. But really, this isn't just about a coastal adaptation projects. There's legacy and community, uh, also design excellence and climate adaptation itself that we had to put into account to, uh, to, to come away with an amazing uh, collective of, of strategies and ideas. A little bit more context here on uh, site assessments and planning. 
you know, uh, the areas uh, uh, that we're going to be discussing right now sit around Wagner Park, primarily around Wagner Park, but the South Battery Park City Residency Project is actually composed of, of four sub projects with, you know, a northern and a southern tie back that actually tie into the adjacent coastal adaptation projects. Um, here is a, a, a sense of how the elevations actually work currently, I mean, existing elevations and how we had to, you know, really understand how these various levels allow for different kinds of opportunities for the uh, re uh, risk reduction uh, component of the project. Uh, uh, one of the, one of the uh, th things that uh, Nikita highlighted was this uh, fact that, you know, we, there was a substantial uh, collaboration with the community in, in various aspects. We had in-person meetings, we have web uh, surveys, we had feedback sessions through a, through a number of years. And it's, it's, it's how we actually collectively put together a design idea and strategy for the work itself. You know, working with our engineers and our community leaders and our designers, you know, we kind of combined a lot of the, the wants and needs of the projects and, you know, ensure that the purpose of the project was executed uh, in, in, in a robust uh, way. You know, from starting 2018 all the way to now where we're actually in construction, there has been a number of, uh, of uh, opportunities to connect and uh, basically fine tune how the, the design develops, you know, how it actually developed. Every step along the way, we learned something new and we were able to actually polish as we moved along the ideas so that we can come away with the best project possible. Um, here's just an example of some of the, some of the key, sorry, my mouse is freaking out. Some of the key uh, takeaways, you know, ensuring uh, visibility to the waterfront, that there was this continuous uh, notion of how the, the currently uh, Wagner Park is organized, the ascension of the alley through the alley of trees, you know, a main entrance to the pavilion, ensure uh, waterfront connectivity along the Esplanade and many other aspects of uh, ecology and sustainability were a lot of uh, topics of discussion that went into account when we put together the design idea. Um, and now getting into the actual, uh, I guess, meat of the, of the conversation, which is how we achieved all these credits. You know, we're not gonna go very specifically, like tell you every little detail about these credits, but we're gonna just give you an overview um, and of course, you know, there's, there's plenty of venues in the future to continue to have this conversation because we're really proud of what we put together here. Um, so the first one is to avoid and reduce uh, risk from coastal hazards. I mean, that's pretty much what drives these projects. Um, it's, you know, one of the things that we came away with was to create a very seamless transition between how placemaking functions with the infrastructure of the work or, or the project itself. We were able to actually bury the flood walls running almost entirely through Wagner Park. And um, we actually managed to uh, marry this set of elevations with a series of public spaces that are in, in a way transitional between elevations. And you'll get a little bit more about that as we go. And whenever possible, you know, the, 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 the flood protection will actually sneak out and connect to another level of protection moving into the south uh, with uh, PRA and also to the north with the Museum of Jewish Heritage Jewish heritage interventions that then eventually will tie into the Northwest, Northwest Resiliency Project. So here's a bit of a section just to get a sense of how the elevations work. And again, we're not gonna be talking about numbers, but just if you can kind of follow your eye through that dotted line, that represents the existing elevation of where we were. And then everything above that is basically a representation of where we're headed with the Coastal Protection Project here in, in, the, in the Wagner Park portion of the work you know, there's that very slow well, right running right through uh, through the park that is pretty much concealed, which was uh, an incredible um, design achievement. I think you know the fact that we were able to disguise how the how the project actually serves as a protection uh, mechanism, but it's packaged and wrapped around the idea of an amazing waterfront park. Um, as you move into the Esplanade, you see how those elevations begin to change, allowing for various levels of coastal uh, uh, protection, you know, frequent flood into future years, you know, smaller uh, um, um, storm uh, events and things of that nature. While the flood flood actually hit that 2050, 100 year flood benchmark that we're all sort of working for very hardly. 
On to the next credit uh, with ecological sensitivity, you know, we have to kind of place the site within all of these sensitivities to ecology. And because of the elevation that we're sort of setting up the park into, we were actually able to create an ecotone of various landscape, landscape types. You know, as you move into, for example, the, uh, the Esplanade, we have a series of performative gardens that are escalated, escalated as you move down into the water. Um, you know, the Pier A inlet uh, habitat shelves are probably one of the most exciting features in terms of ecology. They're brand new features. They actually have become an, an educational component, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what those components are coming up. The lawn itself, it, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very vast, elevated plain that provides a lot of shade and, 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 and opportunities for people to respite within this environment. And so on and so forth. I mean, these are sort of ecologies that are that are working within the set of elevations that we set for the project. Uh, and here is a little bit of a, a preview of what's to come with 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 the work itself. Here's that Pier 8 inlet that I briefly mentioned, and how you know these systems of new ecologies would allow for a lot of educational components, and um, you're actually be able to see how it, you know ecology and habitats emerge out of these shelf units that become almost a destination for Battery Park City and Lower Manhattan in it, into itself. On to the next credit, uh, you know, the siting of structure, uh, all structures and even landscapes to prevent from, uh, you know, impeding these incredible views that we have of Lower Manhattan and also to the Statue of Liberty. You know, everything went into careful account, you know, with, with uh, conversations that we have with the community and our public sector leaders and our clients about like where to carefully craft all of these components so that we do not take away the look and feel of what we have in Wagner Park, particularly around view sheds. So not getting into specifics of where we place everything, but as you can see in this diagram, there was a huge emphasis in, in sort of promoting vast open vistas where it actually matters the most when you're entering the park, when you're navigating along the, the uh, upper areas of the park, as you're navigating or descending into the Esplanade, there'll be a series of peeled view sheds that uh, will uh, provide a level of, of amenity that is carefully um, choreographed and orchestrated. So it's, it's quite wonderful. We look forward to, to seeing it all built. And just like, you know, like what we had uh, way back uh, in the day, you know, this, this, this issue of celebrating the harbor, like in how you move uh, through the park from the city, you know, with a lot of visitors coming from the Battery and from the neighborhood, from Battery Park City coming from the north, entering this harmonious uh, entrance into the park right at the center. And the first thing that you would get in is this amazing view of the Statue of Liberty as a, as a major framing point for the work itself. Um, here's a, a, a rendering of what we anticipate this whole place is going to look and feel like. As you see, you can sneak through all of these canopies, those view sheds that we were, that I was just discussing, but particularly right around the center of the park with this sort of gathering space that actually opens up into the harbor and creates this amazing experience for, for New Yorkers and for people in the, in the, in the Battery Park City neighborhoods. So on to the next credit, uh, which is to uh, quality public access to the waterfront. And, and this one is one that kind of uh, excites me the most because for the first time, you know, we actually have a continuous esplanade connecting the entirety of Battery Park City into the Battery in Lower Manhattan, which is something that we didn't have before. Um, there's a lot of uh, quality community spaces that are gonna be hosted within the pavilion that is also uh, a part of our project and it's under construction. Uh, there will be a small restaurant. There will be access to uh, to the roof uh, to uh, to actually allow for even more experiential uh, view sheds and things of that nature. But into itself, the entire park is is, is a is a very robust uh, uh, waterfront access, if you may. And here is a, a bit of a, a another vignette or, or rendering of what we anticipate these transitional gardens moving from the upper levels of the park along into the esplanade and how they're very seamlessly connected and allow for universal access and more importantly those openness and view sheds and places for people to be when they're hanging out in Wagner Park. 
here's another view of the center lawn. Sorry, now it's freaking again. The center lawn here with Again, you know, every opportunity that we had to carefully orchestrate the legacy that Battery Park City provides, we, we took, you know, with the installation of these art pieces, outdoor sculptural works. I mean, we've actually dedicated a number of them in a way that are sort of central to the experience, but not, uh, not they don't become a barrier to the actual waterfront view sheds. And they're really, really wonderful from amazing artists, uh, New Yorkers actually. Um, we go and sorry about this thing it's freaking out. and on to the next credit here we go provide diverse uh, programming and passive educational features you know the the i think the, the the protagonist here like the one that i think we're mostly excited about is the pra inlet uh because it's one that it's kind of like you know we have different versions currently of of all these um educational components but the pra inlet is going to be a special place and and I'll you know I'll go into a little bit more detail and all of that. But throughout the park, you know, we're gonna make sure that you're understanding that there is context to everything that we built, you know, by putting together panels that describe that experience as you move around in and around the park, you know, whether we're celebrating a local leader or we're telling you a little bit about what is a resilient future or what is all what's what's a park with a resiliency component and coastal adaptation is all about. I mean, all of those things went into account as, as, we, as we want the user to have the experience of learning about how these things came about and also have an incredible time visiting the park. Um, this is another thing that we actually worked very, we took it very seriously, this issue of uh, universal access and uh, uh, connectivity through a series of pathways. You know, as I mentioned earlier, if you follow the bottom line along the waterfront esplanade, I mean, that is brand new continuous waterfront access that basically connects the entirety of lower Manhattan that we're really excited about. But also through the transitional gardens, you know, there was a heavy emphasis of creating um, surfaces and treatments that were really comfortable to navigate and actually move from one plane to the other. Uh, the event terrace or the social gathering space, it's, it's, it's also uh, a path that you can kind of accommodate universal accessibility into. So from every way that you think about it, the park is really, really porous with respect to circulation. I mean, it was, it was really important that there was no, we did not neglect in any way, any portions of the park. Everything is equally porous. And of course, you know, we fought really hard to have a central ring around the big lawn and that, you know, there's, there's gonna be like a, like a stroller uh, experience there for, for park users, which we're really excited about as well. So here's another um, view uh, and, and how that experience of universal accessibility and connectivity to the waterfront is all about. You see, we're standing right at the corner of Pure Plaza and looking north into the alley of trees that actually descend into the portal of the park, which uh, is the pavilion. As you enter the pavilion, it becomes a grand entrance into the, into the, into the core of Wagner Park. But also, as, as I mentioned a few times now, and I have, I'm just so excited about that idea of having that sort of connectivity along the esplanade move through the edge, uh, allowing the waterfront to be free uh, for once all throughout lower Manhattan, which I'm very excited about. So on to the next credit, um, you know, ecologically enhanced uh, structural components. You know, we took, uh, you know, the PRA as a, as a basically a protagonist to allow us to do all of this. You know, this is a resilient edge. And, and the PRA inlet, as I mentioned before, is composed of actually a series of terrace conditions that introduce and improve new habitats, uh, new habitat creations. And we're also, you know, we're, we were, uh, we work very, very closely with our engineers and, and other, um, members of our team to ensure that even the structure, within the structure, we can find opportunities to enhance uh, ecosystems, like whether we have a veneer around piles or eco-concrete veneers, or, you know, where we have, a, you know, it's actually happening mostly around the city and other cities around. We have this sort of eco-prefabricated -pre, uh, uh, concrete riprap that allow for a series of like uh, transitional pools for habitat creation and all of that. Um, and the plant in itself, it's, it's, it's tidal, right? It, it is designed in such a way that it kind of floods 
from time to time and it allows for a different kind of ecotone to emerge from the wet zones into the drier zones as we move upland. So again, this whole thing is gonna be an ecological display and we ensure that you know, there was a hefty amount of platform and opportunities for people to be uh, nested within this environment. It's very immersive. You're gonna be able to access it all the way through. Um, here's a bit of a sampler. Obviously, we have a bunch of other uh, habitat, um, you know, um, uh, um, um, participants uh, in, in the intertidal zone, for example, with uh, critters and uh, aquatic habitat, you know, and how we intend to sort of like um, attract all of these to our structures and to the shelves that we've created. But like what I also think it's really important to highlight is that sort of ecotone that I have been mentioning. Uh, I mentioned a couple of times before, where you go from like water into inland into upland meadows and woodland. I think it's 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 going to be a fantastic display of uh, of ecological systems that move through elevation as you navigate the park. You might not think about those things as you're navigating through the park, but uh, you know I hope that you know when the park is all done and built, you kind of pay attention to how it's changing. Its ecology is changing from, from the water into the higher levels of the, of, the, of the park itself. And here is a snippet of like what that Pure Inlet is all about, that ecological habitat trace. You see how it's actually strategically uh, engineered and composed and the kinds of, uh, if you can imagine this, the kinds of ecosystems that would be created on each of these platforms as you move all the way into the upper areas of the park, which I think are pretty cool. So um, again, I think I've, I've bit it over the head with this point, uh, with the whole sort of ecological system connectivity, you go from low to high, and each of these landscape types present a specific set of uh, landscape treatments or ecological treatments. And again, like one thing to get ahead of, like uh, I hope it's, if you're on this call, it's because you're excited about what's coming up. So, um, you know, the, the blue area, you know, that, that entire landscape treatment is completely different than that you would get in the transitional gardens along the waterfront. So if you want to spend an afternoon as, as nested within the alleys or the northern ornamental gardens, that is going to be a completely different experience than the one you will have if you're along the waterfront esplanade and also the lawn and all of that. Um, another credit, uh, uh, another series of credits that we have, which uh, have to do with stormwater management. You know, we, you know, we put a, a huge emphasis in sort of the creation of these ecotones or, you know, ecological systems within the park. But we also had to be uh, conscious about runoff and um, and capture some stormwater whenever possible to put it back into work. You know, the park actually hosts. Uh, a large uh, cistern underneath the, uh, the central lawn that is able to kind of recycle and probably use for other purposes. Within the uh, transitional gardens, you see those blue dots in there. Because of the way that the park is graded from the upper to the lower level, these are sort of very natural deposits for bioretention uh, beds that we can kind of infiltrate water and then put into a, a, a gallery basin that for possible either reuse or uh, treatment before it goes back out into uh, into the water. So um, again, uh, MKA did an incredible job of putting together these ideas and strategies. And and again, uh, I have to give uh, you know everyone in the design team and site works in particular for working the specifics about the technical aspects of how to make all of these uh, nuances work uh, with respect to the runoff and all of that. We have, like I have mentioned a number of times, an incredible team. Here's a, a, a view of the Northern Gardens. And again, I, I, I think, you know, I have been kind of telling you a little bit about how experiences are very carefully crafted and they're very distinctive. You know, when you're in the peer eight zone, you know, in that educational PRA component, the look and feel and what you actually experience is very different than that we have in the Northern Gardens. We actually work with Battery Park City Parks, uh, their team to put together a gamut of planting materials that are part of the legacy of Battery Park City Parks uh, throughout. So this is sort of like a continuation of what they do really, really well. And we put a series of display gardens uh, that are a little bit more uh, 
uh, intentional in the way that you move around them, you experience them, they become basically um, uh, seasonal displays for a, a wonderful catalog of, of, of planting material that Battery Park City has uh, always put forward every summer, spring, and uh, fall. I'd say it's one of the places in the city where the parks look the, be the most beautiful all year round, not throwing any shade at anybody. That's just the way it looks. Uh, always, they look fantastic. So we were really happy to work with them. And so that's kind of what this is about. I mean, I know that I could probably spend another 40 minutes just talking about design ideas and walking you through animation sections and talk to you a little bit about a little bit more about experiences, but we wanted to get to how um, the accreditation uh, and the, uh, was achieved. Uh, and so uh, we're really happy again. Thank you. And I'm just one of many, many people in the design team that has put in a lot of work and worked really hard to ensure that we will have a, an incredible set of public spaces in the South Battery Park City Resiliency Project. Thank you. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to the Alliance to perhaps um, um, open it for questions if there are any for any one of us. Yeah, so well, thank you, Gonzalo. That was wonderful. And uh, I can see your passion for it too, which is uh, fantastic. So yeah, uh, please put your questions in the chat. <laughs> we do have, um, I think, oh, we have, it's a new question that came through. Okay, great. So um, one question, I think these, this may be for Gwen, but um, what 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 will be what will happen to Wagner Park during construction? And then the next question um, for maybe for Gonzalo is what is a relieving platform? I think you mentioned that in your presentation. So so um, so how about those two questions first? Sure. <clears throat> because of the um, the significant design flood elevation that um, that need needed to be. Uh, achieved with the South Battery Park City Resil Resiliency Project, we um, needed to raise the level of the park uh, by about 10 feet in order to accommodate the buried flood wall. That did um, require that the park um, be um, be redone um, so that the, the uh, previously existing park um, was uh, demolished along with the, um, the pavilion, the park pavilion. Um, and that uh, construction is currently underway uh, for the, the new redesigned um, Wagner Park and the new pavilion as, as Gonzalo described. Okay, and then the next question about a relieving platform. Yeah, it's a, it's a very sort of easy, uh, if you can kind of like look at my hand. So, so this is terra firma, right? This is where we were actually able to install the passive treatment, the wall that is actually serving as a main form of protection for Wagner Park. A relieved platform is basically a deck that sits in front of it, sits on piles, and it's basically what's, what's made up of the, uh, the esplanade itself. So think about it as a, as, a, as a cantilever edge. That's what the, the relieving platform is. So you obviously cannot install a, a strong passive system over a deck, which is why we went inland, what, you know, the most immediate point possible and then the relieved platform is basically a, a, a cantilever pier that moves along the edge of the majority of Battery Park City. Okay, great. Um, and then related to that, can you elaborate, this is a question from Matthew Choi, can you elaborate on why edge resilience was a challenge for this project and why was it not possible to extend the uh the edge at, that you see um near pier A all the way around the the You want to do you want to describe that, Gonzalo? Yeah, yeah, I can I can give that a shot. It's uh, again, it's uh, these are very complex uh challenges, right? But the, the the easiest way to explain it is that there are different kinds of subsurface conditions along the edge of Lower Manhattan, and I'm not just talking about Battery Park City, but throughout you know, like subway tunnels or, you know, relieving platforms or, uh, you know, there isn't simply enough uh, space underneath us to allow us to install infrastructures that can serve as flood protections. And so the answer to that is subsurface uh, conditions. They were, they did not allow us to package a passive treatment all around that area. And we had to go for other kinds of either other systems like deployables or, 
you know, slightly elevated platforms that, you, that we can go up to an A level before they become too, too heavy. And so really it's about, uh, like I mentioned, subsurface, subsurface condition, and they are very different throughout the entire edge. Okay, great. All right. Um, so there are a few questions about uh, the scientists that were involved in the review team and, and also what the qualifications are. So um, I think we may answer those online as well as I'll give just a basic answer, which is that um, we we made sure we make sure for every single one of our projects that the review team does include the the best in in terms of technical expertise um, for the conservation science or the ecologists that are that are part of the review team. Um, they are they get involved and they become a part of the review team uh, as first the first step being uh, a wedge professional and then they they apply for the position with us and they're vetted and and the we as you can see from the earlier slides that I presented on our technical advisory teams we we have some of the best and the best across the country who are part of both the technical advisory teams as well as the uh, as well as the review teams and. Um, so that that's just the process that we use internally. Um, and then the next question I think I want to have you guys answer is um, if there's a plan for monitoring habitat and species over time for the park, for the project. Yeah, this was certainly investigated. Um, there are there were conservation scientists engaged and um, the Hudson River Foundation was also um, engaged early on to explore opportunities for this. Um, I don't believe, based on my knowledge, um, these plans are are funded at this time. Um, but the studies have been done, and so there are opportunities. Gwen, we, I'll, I'll let you. We are we're we're combining those efforts um, of future uh, monitoring along with our Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project. So those um, will those. Uh, plans and uh, strategies will be uh, utilized, but they will be done as a whole with both uh, our South Battery Park City Resiliency Project and the Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project, which is currently in design. Right. All right. Um, I'll answer the last question here about how Waterfront Alliance breaks into new markets. We have a full team that does outreach and marketing. We speak at conferences. So there's a whole plan as well as our Wedge Professionals Network that helps us with the new markets. And then I think that um, the last question we will answer, um, just because we're running out of time, would be um, maybe a, a two, uh, I'll combine two of the questions that we're getting. One is, are the walkways or the pathways the Esplanade made using using pervious materials and then would it be possible to um to substitute natural stone for the eco concrete that you've um that you that are, is, are part of the design and is there an aspect of embodied carbon related to the eco concrete if anybody can answer that question can you answer that Gonzalo? Nikita, can you take that one? I think that's a little bit more up your... Sure, to the best of my abilities. So regarding mm -hmm. the eco-concrete, I, I cannot speak to um, alternatives that were considered, um, but this was very intentionally selected to um, create the kind of medium required for, for um, habitat um, integration. Um, a slightly an adjacent note would be that low embodied carbon concrete has been specified across the entire um, park and the pavilion building. Um, and, and we think that's been a really successful effort to get concrete manufacturers in the area to um, produce lower carbon concrete across the board. Um, and then the other question I believe it had to do with- um, Permeous surface on the pathways. Yeah. Correct. I, I think again, from a durability perspective, many of the pavers themselves may not be but the entire stormwater management and drainage design ensures that that water is managed on site um, and has somewhere to go, is, is treated and then discharged accordingly. Okay, wonderful. We are out of time. Thank you all so much. Nikita Gonzalo, Gwen, the full team at the Waterfront Alliance, and all of you for asking great questions and being there. And if you have any other questions, please make sure to let Waterfront Alliance know. And congratulations to the full team and South Battery Park City Authority. 
Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Enjoy Thank the you. rest of the week, everyone. Thanks for joining. Bye. Bye. Bye.